Welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. If you're new here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. Today we're going to be talking about a very common condition called polymyalgia rheumatica or PMR. So let's just get into it. <laughs> talking about PMR today. If that sounds like something that you're interested in or know someone who is, make sure you subscribe, like this video, share it with anyone you know could use this information. It really helps us out. And before getting right into PMR, I want to spend just a few seconds to talk about my new free online course called the Productive Rheumatology Appointment Guide. It was built to help anyone with a chronic medical condition who needs to see a rheumatologist understand how to think about their symptoms, their diagnosis, the treatments, and how to make the most out of these short appointment times. No one teaches you how to be a patient with a chronic medical condition, and the learning curve is steep. So this guide was built to make that learning curve just a little bit easier. All right, so if you're interested at all, it's free, so there's no excuses, and there's a link down in the description box. So let's just get to PMR. Okay, so polymyalgia rheumatica, or PMR, from a rheumatologist's point of view, is a super satisfying condition because we can take someone who comes in in a wheelchair to being completely normal in a matter of days. So let's talk about what it is, why we get it, and who gets it. So polymyalgia rheumatica is an autoimmune inflammatory condition that almost exclusively affects those of us over 50 years old. And the incidence of PMR goes up as we get older with a peak in our 70s and 80s. So it's very, very rare, if not impossible, to be a young person with PMR. Now, just like most of my autoimmune conditions, women are two times more likely to be affected than men. But as opposed to a lot of my other conditions, family history really doesn't seem to make much of a difference with this one. Now the highest incidence is seen in those with Scandinavian or Northern European descent. Um, it's much less likely in those with Asian, African American, or Latino descent, but certainly not impossible to see. Now the big question, why does this happen? Well, I mean, like most of my autoimmune conditions, I don't have a good answer for that. And in fact, when it comes to PMR, we're a little bit behind as far as really understanding even what's going on with the immune system. We're still at the point of research where they're looking at what exactly does the immune system look like in someone who has PMR. Now, there does seem to be a seasonal aspect to PMR, which then has led some to believe there might be a virus involved, um, but the data is very preliminary and we're a long way from being able to fully understand that. Now, the name polymyalgia, that word myalgia, implies a muscle problem. But the truth is, it's really not a disease of the muscles. In fact, when we do imaging, either MRIs or ultrasounds, of the areas of the body where the person has the most symptoms, we find the muscles aren't really inflamed, and it's the structures around the joints that are inflamed. So the tendons and the bursa. And we'll get more into that when we talk about symptoms. All right, so what are the signs and symptoms of polymyalgia rheumatica, PMR? Well, first off, it is a condition that kind of comes at you out of the blue. As opposed to things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis that can kind of creep up on you, PMR seems to come out of the blue a lot of times, where someone's feeling great and then boom, they can't, you know, they have a lot of pain and stiffness. Now, where is that pain and stiffness? Good question. <laughs> it really starts in the shoulders and the hips. A lot of times it starts in the shoulders and then it goes to the hips. And so people will have a lot of pain and stiffness in the morning in the shoulders. They have a difficulty raising their arms, combing their hair, brushing their teeth. And when it gets to the hips, it can really cause a lot of problems getting up from a seated position. Now, it can also affect things like the elbows and the knees, but it's definitely not as common. Um, and the real hallmark is going to be the shoulder and the hips. Now I did mention one thing that's super important and that is morning stiffness. 
In fact, morning stiffness is, is kind of required for it to be PMR. And that means that when you wake up in the morning, you have a really hard time getting moving. It can take an hour or more to kind of be able to move more comfortably. And that's seen in, in pretty much everyone with PMR. Now, other symptoms people can have, they can feel fatigued, they can have decreased appetite, sometimes even see a little bit of weight loss, and this is all a result of kind of the systemic inflammation that's going on in the body. You can get low-grade fevers with PMR, but I will say if you're having really high fevers, that's not something we typically see with PMR, and so your doctor really should be thinking of thinking broadly about what else could be going on. Okay, so, you know, I'm a rheumatologist, and if you ever have to see a rheumatologist, you'll know one of the first things we do is draw blood, and we usually draw a lot of blood because we have a lot of tests. Well, with PMR, it's actually, we don't really have that many blood tests. There's no autoantibodies that we have found to be associated with PMR, so there's nothing that kind of nails the diagnosis. And the one thing that we look for is elevation of our inflammatory markers. Now, I've mentioned these markers in a lot of other videos because we test them in a lot, if not all, of our conditions. These markers are called the ESR, or the sed rate, or sedimentation rate, and the CRP, the C-reactive protein. These are markers in our body that tend to go up when we have something inflammatory going on, and they're not specific. So they go up if you have a cancer, they go up if you have an infection, and they can go up if you have an autoimmune condition. So you have to take the results of these inflammatory markers in context with what's going on with the person. But when it comes to PMR, the overwhelming majority of people will have elevations of both their sed rate and their CRP. Now, I said overwhelming majority, but not everyone. In fact, it's been estimated anywhere between five to 10% might actually even have a normal sedimentation rate or ESR or CRP. So it's certainly not common and not what we expect, but it's not impossible. But really, those are really the only labs we would see. Other changes like anemia or maybe a little bit of um, evidence of dehydration, those are just going to be consequences of the overall inflammatory state of the body and aren't particularly specific for PMR. And that's really it. The one thing everyone with PMR needs to be aware of is the association of PMR with giant cell arteritis, otherwise known as temporal arteritis. So what is that? Well, if we break down the word arteritis, it's artery, so blood vessel, and itis, inflammation. So this is a condition where the big juicy blood vessels, arteries, of, that go into the head and the neck get inflamed. And giant cell is just the type of cell that we see under the microscope. And temporal just refers to the temporal artery. So this is a condition that thankfully is not as common as PMR. In fact, PMR is about two to three times more common than giant cell arteritis, but they oftentimes can travel together. Giant cell arteritis, about 50% of them will also have PMR. But thankfully, it's not true the other way around. Only about 10% of PMR patients will develop giant cell arteritis. So why is this association really important? Well, giant cell arteritis can have a lot of more serious effects than PMR, and so if you start developing the symptoms of giant cell arteritis, you need to let your doctor know right away. So what are the symptoms? Well, headaches, pain when chewing, tenderness along the temporal artery, so that's gonna be tenderness right here, as well as any vision changes. So if anyone with PMR is developing those symptoms, it's the kind of thing you need to let your doctor know right away. And the reason is because if it goes untreated, you can't have permanent vision changes. And so we want to prevent that. And thankfully, we can prevent that. But we prevent it by starting treatment right away. Okay, so what is the treatment for PMR? Well, I'll just get to it. It's prednisone. It's prednisone, and I know I've, I have whole videos about how you shouldn't need to be on prednisone. I talk about how prednisone is old-fashioned and comes with a lot of side effects and that you, know, you should only use it in particular circumstances, and that's true for a lot of autoimmune conditions. But PMR is just not there yet, and we just really rely on prednisone. 
but there is some good news. So the good news is most people with PMR do not require high doses of prednisone. So as opposed to someone, for example, like a lupus patient who's having a severe flare, they might need quote unquote high doses. And in the world of rheumatology, a high dose of prednisone is considered anything like 50 or 60 or above milligrams a day. Thankfully, PMR patients don't, necess don't usually need those levels of prednisone to get control of the inflammation. Most of the time, someone with PMR will get complete resolution of their symptoms using 20, 25 milligrams of prednisone. So that's one good thing. The other good piece of news is that PMR, for most people, will not be a lifelong condition. This is a condition where the majority of people will need to be on treatment from 9 to 24 months and, and then be fine. Now, of course, there's a minority of patients that will have particularly difficult to control disease and might need medication for longer than that, but the majority of people really deal with this for about two years. Now, the bad news, or well, I guess it's just like the bad news part, is that when you are treating PMR and you are using prednisone and you're coming down on your dose of prednisone over the course of many months, relapses or flares tend to be more the rule than the exception. And that's a big bummer. But you go into it knowing that and having a game plan on how to deal with it. And usually, and I'm, I'm generalizing, and this is definitely something you're going to want to talk more in detail with with your doctor, but usually the way you deal with that is just simply going back up to the dose of prednisone that you were doing well on and giving it a little more time before trying to keep going down. Now, I did mention the small minority of patients who are going to have a more difficult time and might find that they just need to be on those higher doses of prednisone for longer than the average PMR patient, or that they're having recurrent you know, relapses or flares that they just can't seem to get a hold of. We do have a few non-prednisone immune system specific medications that we will use in those cases. Now, you might ask, well, why don't we just jump to those medicines in the first place? Well, number one, they're not that great as far as their effectiveness. And prednisone is just so effective and the majority of people don't need to go to these other medications. But what, what are those medications? So things like methotrexate. Um, also, we will sometimes use a medication called tocilizumab, which is one of our new biologics. These are medicines that we reserve for those who have a particularly difficult PMR case, but my point in bringing this up is that there are options if you find yourself to be in that category. All right, so you know I always like to kind of bring it home and talk about you and talk about how you can take all this information and apply it to yourself. And I think in the case of PMR, the biggest thing is talking to your doctor about the prednisone. Now I have two big videos on prednisone, one about how we kind of think about it and use it in rheumatology and the other one talking about all the dangers and side effects of prednisone. And if you find yourself on, with PMR needing prednisone or really any autoimmune condition needing prednisone, I would highly recommend that you go check those out. Um, but in PMR, because we rely so much on prednisone, as part of your treatment plan, you've got to talk about the prednisone. you got to talk about what's our goal and how we're going to get off of it, like what's a realistic goal, and what kind of side effects can I expect, and what can I do to try to prevent those side effects, because there are some things. So looking out for your bone health, making sure your vitamin D is up to par. Do you need a bone scan to see if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis? Do you need something to protect your stomach? If you're a diabetic, you might need to see your doctor who helps you manage your blood sugar because when you're on prednisone, your blood sugar can become a little more difficult to control. Blood pressure is a huge one. When people need to be on prednisone, their blood pressure can go up and so you might need a little help 
while you're on the prednisone to control that blood pressure. So my opinion is when you have PMR, aside from talking about giant cell arteritis and the signs and symptoms that you need to look out for, but you also need to talk about how you're gonna manage this prednisone because the prednisone is probably gonna be in your life for one to maybe two years. So that's it. That's what I've got about PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica. Very common, in fact, second only to rheumatoid arthritis when it comes to systemic autoimmune conditions in adults. So chances are you may actually know someone who might have PMR. Um, I hope you found this useful, some little nuggets of information that you can then take back to your doctor and kind of continue the conversation. As always, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, share this with anyone you think could benefit from this information. Here at Connected Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.